Hi, this is Kate. Just before you listen to this next episode, I wanted to let you know about an opportunity with Amicable. As you may know, we're thrilled about the upcoming historic change in the divorce law. And I know that for many of you too, this has been a long time coming. So if you are waiting for the introduction of the no-fault system, and you're happy to share your story with others, then please get in touch with Amicable today. We're looking for couples who are happy to talk to the media about this seismic change in the law. Please contact us no later than the 24th of March using the email address hello at amicable.co.uk. Thanks very much. Enjoy this next episode. The Divorce Podcast. Welcome to The Divorce Podcast a podcast that aims to address divorce here in the UK, countering the often sensationalist way it's portrayed in the media, challenging the status quo and hopefully driving reform. On each episode, I'm joined by experts to discuss divorce from different angles and to give their opinions and to debate them. I'm Kate Daly, a relationship counsellor and divorce coach, co-founder of Amicable, the divorce services company and host of The Divorce Podcast. On this episode, I'm delighted to be joined by David Hodson, OBE, a family law specialist, deputy district judge, mediator and co-founder of International Family Law Group. David, thank you for joining me. My pleasure, Kate. If I could start by asking you about how you think divorce has changed over the past 35 years that you have been practising. I think the divorce has moved really to the sidelines. When I first started, it was the central part. There was the ancillary relief. We actually called it ancillary relief, the financial claims. The divorce was central. Um, It was where the concentration, there was actually a hearing at court. Uh, They were known as the Section 41 child arrangement hearings, and everyone had to turn up to a, a court hearing, which was an absolute waste of time, and everyone knew it. And it's moved very much to the sidelines in the legal process. The problem is it hasn't moved to the sidelines in the perception of the clients. And so we've had a real difference where the lawyers have said, oh, well, it's that little thing on the side. We'll give it to a paralegal to fill in the divorce petition. It goes through fairly quickly. Well, not fairly quickly in some courts. It goes through and let's get on with the real meat. Uh, Let's get on and sort out the financial matters. No lawyer makes any profit over dealing with the divorce. Simple reality is profits not there. And so bit by bit, uh, we had the special procedure came through in the early 1980s where you no longer had to go to court, you no longer had to prove anything, etc. And I know it's the High Court Judge Paul Corridge has said that the biggest change that ever occurred was actually having the special procedure. And so bit by bit, it, it, it's moved off to the sidelines. And soon many of us are looking forward to having online divorce. Right. Again, it'll be so. Mm-hmm. But in the meantime, for ordinary people going through this process, the divorce is central to them. And right. where mm-hmm. the problem, where the call for the no fault divorce is coming from, quite rightly, in my opinion, is people are saying, lawyers don't worry about it, but the public do. And for them, it means a lot more than we realise. And I think perhaps mistakenly, inadvertently, we lawyers have lost touch with that. And I think the court for no fault divorce has been a very welcome wake up call. Hey, guys, we've all got to realise actually what goes on in the divorce matters to the parties. Right. So whilst lawyers, you think, have been more concentrated on the financial aspects in the minds of people who are going through this for the first time, who are confronted by what must seem quite archaic wording and often legalese wording, for those people, there's still a lot of anxiety about the actual basics, nitty gritty of getting divorced. And, and, And many of them may not want it or may not want it yet. We, we all know that at a time of separation, one spouse may be going much faster than the other. Mm-hmm. One may have come to a view over three or four years, oh, well, I don't think much of this relationship is bit by bit, and the other may not realise it. Um, one's staggered at how many times one, one meets people who say, I had no idea the relationship was that bad. Mm-hmm. I thought it was OK. It's not a gender thing. It, it, it applies across the board. It applies across all sorts of spectrum. And, and, and so... Getting to the point where both people say, OK, we'll now have a divorce is rare. One of them is usually ahead of the other. And so therefore, the legal process is used to gain an advantage and one of them becomes a petitioner. And so, again, the fault element of the divorce, and, and that's been another big change over the last 20, 30 years, has become to the fore. When Parliament changed the law in 1969, 73, they said, oh, well, everyone will be nice and civilised and we'll have two-year separation petitions. And, and for a long time, the two-year separation petitions came through. I remember when I first started, first 10 years of my career in the 1980s, etc., we were all doing two-year separation petitions and we were often doing separation agreements. 
And then what happened is that the separation agreements didn't become, they, they weren't upheld. Yeah, they're not they legally a, binding. They're not legally no. binding. And, and so we had a series of cases where people overturned the separation agreement. And so we lawyers, almost within a year or so, suddenly changed and said, don't rely on the separation agreement. Issue now, get a consent order now. Mm. Sorry, Kate, I come back to the yeah. finances because that's how it reminds of our lawyers. And so we said, right, we no, no need to get a divorce now. And so we moved away from the civilised, etc., two-year separation to the fort-based. Mm. And so we have statistics in this country that 75% are fort-based, 80%, maybe a little less, is issued by women as the petitioners. Mm. Why? Because there's a huge amount of fault going on? No, because they need the financial remedies, they need the financial right. claims, they need the financial orders. And yet, underlying it all, people are saying, am I ready for it? Or is this going too quick? Or do I want a time to reflect? And so that is why I must say when in 1996, Parliament debated no fault divorce, mm. I was really committed to it, still highly committed to it, but I liked the model. The model came out of the Law Commission, mm -hmm. Baroness Howe had been pushing it as well. An idea where you have a period of reflection and consideration. One of them may be faster ahead in their thinking and the other one has a chance to catch up. And then after a period, it was three months in the legislation, the divorce then goes through. What went wrong in 1996 is that it completely lost its way in Parliament and what no, went it in was political good. will. It, it, what went in was very different to what mm -hmm. came out and we right. had a short... And it, it was just a dread, dreadful mess and in due course it was done. And so as we're having this debate now about no-fault divorce, to me, I think the no-fault divorce, uh, there's going to be hardly anyone, I would say, mm -hmm. including religious communities, who will be strongly against it. There'll be some, mm -hmm. but not many. The issue to me is what's the model... Right. And there's been insufficient attention as to what the model is. And some of the models are, let's just have a, a divorce on demand. Like effectively, uh, you give notice and you give notice and there's the divorce straight so away. So the other person has no opportunity to say, no, I don't want this or no anything like that. No reflection and consideration. Right. Even okay. if we don't allow an opposition to it, then still there ought to be a period of time to reflect and right. consider. So it would be an instant divorce. It would be effectively fairly quick, Fine. fairly okay. quick within mm -hmm. a very short period of time. For myself, I would either favour a period of reflection and consideration, as we had in the original 1996 legislation as it went into Parliament, or perhaps, as, as they do in the Australian model, have a 12-month period of separation, but you could be separate under the same roof. Right. And many mm -hmm. couples separate and, and they live under the same roof, but with the opportunity to have financial claims running before the separation is up. And right. that's what the President of the Family Division, James Humbley, is very keen on, so-called decoupling the divorce from the finances. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because at the moment we can't start the divorce, so we can't start the finances until we've got the divorce. Until we've got the nice eye. And, and, yep. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So let's get rid of that. And I know the President is very keen on it. Let's just get rid of that. Let's have the power to bring the financial claims forward. And then people will just bring the divorce forward in due course. There are already a number of cases, many lawyers would have it, where you're doing voluntary disclosure, getting to a voluntary settlement. Neither wants to remarry, neither wants to set up home. The divorce, just let it happen. Right. And so I think if we were to pull back on this, I think that could be a tremendous advantage. So I think the debate needs to be not should we have no fault or not, because I think there'd be very few people opposed mm -hmm. to that. The question is, what's the model that we want? So there's more to it than just, shall we get no yeah. fault divorce that, in this doesn't year? Doesn't help. Yeah. Doesn't help at all because we're all saying, yes, we want no fault divorce. But actually, once we look at the models, we say, oh, no, I don't really want that one. And I'd like that right. one. So I think we need to concentrate more on what and is no the model. And no fault divorce without financial changes as well, or changes to the financial remedy system would be pointless in your it, view or just a missed opportunity? A missed opportunity, yeah. Kate. Yeah. A, a very much a missed opportunity. Because if we're going to reform it, we're going to have a conceptual reanalysis of what is divorce all about, which right. inv inevitably involves what actually is marriage all about. And mm. we're going you can't actually say, how are we going to end it without saying, what are we ending? So to a certain extent, we've got to say, right, what are we ending? How shall we end it? How is it appropriate to end it? Ah, let's have a period of separation or let's have a period of reflection consideration so they can each catch up and come to terms with it, etc. Let's at the same time have a reflection on what the financial arrangements would be. We've got to be aware that the significant majority of people don't need financial orders. They've separated, there's very little to sort out, or they sort it out themselves. But for those who do, we lawyers often hear astonishment from the, the clients who say to us, but hang on a minute, why are we doing this? Why are we doing that? I never thought I was buying into this arrangement or right. this relationship or this expectation. And this is where I think the demographics of our society, the expectations in relationship, whereby we've got more people cohabiting, uh, much later marriage, we've got a different spectrum of marriage, 
And I think the different expectations, perhaps, between the generations as to what the financial outcome is changing dramatically. Right. And yet it is still governed by the expectations we had of 20, 30, 40 years ago. Yes, when one person stayed at home that's and looked right. after the children right. and one and person went out to work. And clearly that's not the case. And even the white case that came through in 2000, where you say, OK, you started with a 50-50 and that's developed. Miller and McFarlane has come through. We've had charm and other cases. We've got a fairly straightforward law now that says the marital assets divided equally unless one of them needs more. And the non-marital assets are not shared at all. Fairly straightforward. I think it's more straightforward than I've known it over a couple of decades. <laughs> But it doesn't necessarily always meet the expectations, particularly as we haven't defined what the marital assets are. And right. I think there's a lot of people, a lot of people who are married, who get very surprised when we speak to them and say, do you realise you're sharing that asset? Oh, no, we never expected that. Or if only I'd known, I'd have kept it in my name, etc. And so I think we've got a, a confluence, if you can call it that, of the law is changing and, and we're reflecting international trends. And I think the expectations of different generations are changing. Mm. And so, as you put it, if I may say, it would be a missed opportunity, as you put it, mm. if we didn't at the same time with divorce reform say, hey, let's actually look at, at where we're going with financial remedies. Mm. I still think we've got one of the best laws anywhere in the world, fairest laws anywhere in the world, particularly fair as far as genders are concerned. Um, we're one of the few countries in the world where women don't have to prove they've made an equal contribution to marriage. Yes. Um, well, I wanted to ask you about that. I mean, there are you've worked in Australia yeah. and you obviously have the international experience. Are we the best in the world or are there other countries that we could learn from? I'm thinking particularly of the Netherlands, where we know there's a there's been a big series of changes in the Netherlands into how they are trying to promote mediation and, and trying to keep more people out of court. Are there countries that we can learn from? I think we can learn from a huge number of countries in different ways. I think there's a difference between the law and the process. I happen to think that our financial provision law is mostly very good indeed. Right. I think it's fairly generous, but I think it's very fair as far as the genders are concerned. And I think it gives proper reflection to the commitments that people make to marriage, giving up career or moving countries, etc. So I think we're pretty good. But there's a lot we can still learn. But I think we've got a lot to learn from some of the other countries, as you say, the Netherlands, which has promoted mediation. Uh, they've also promoted uh, online services, uh, mm. uh, services. Uh, they're reviving that. It worked fairly well a few years ago. They're reviving it, Relator working with them, uh, where we can actually help people through online services to work out better what the outcome will be. Because people have changed in their expectation. The old idea that somebody came along and they sat around a table or sat opposite a table with a solicitor, so usually dressed up to see the solicitor, etc., and so listened to what the solicitor said, oh, that must be right, and did what the solicitor advised. I'm sad to say those days have gone. Right. And people are expecting their services delivered in different ways. Yes. And, and, and the old idea of how services were provided by professionals is just going. And well, let's talk about that a little bit, because obviously from our perspective at Amic, well, our whole sort of passion is about trying to get technology to do yes. the hard work, but maintaining a person involved in all of this because we know it's an emotional journey and, and people want people. So how do you think technology is changing the way that people enter into divorce and understand the process? I think it's changing in different aspects. And to a certain extent, it's removing the emotion from it. The emotion is still there. But if there is emotion there, go to a therapist, go to a counsellor, don't use a They're lawyer. Cheaper. <laughs> much cheaper. <laughs> we much, are definitely cheaper. Much cheaper, much more accessible. <laughs> and actually, specialists in what they're right. doing yes. don't use a lawyer as a therapist. I mean, you know, <laughs> yes. very, very well indeed. So to say that the online process is removing that element. And so just let's do that aspect of it. What I'm interested in is how we move on from that. We move on from divorce online, which some countries are using, and we have fairly running in the next year or so. How can we then move that on to financial aspects? I think children is far more difficult, but I think financial aspects we can. And I'd be very excited to see uh, the law slightly adapting, because we know the divorce online has adapted the law, has pressed the law to change to a certain extent to conform to how we can do it online. I'd like to see the financial law adapting and I would like to see more categorization of assets and make it easier for a couple who don't want to spend a lot of time and money on the divorce process to do a joint uh, process of disclosure, corroboration. 
And there's so many tools on the internet that's now available that we can actually do that. Mm. It's in a sophisticated Excel spreadsheet. Yes. But behind yeah. the sophisticated <laughs> Excel spreadsheet is so much more that can be done. Mm. And we can actually put that in. And who knows, we may see a process in a few years' time where there's a friend of the couple, professional friend of the couple, who helps them with their process of filling in the mm. financial disclosure and getting it. And mediation, to a certain extent, is doing that Ready. Well, let's talk a little bit about mediation because the government have ploughed millions, if not billions of pounds into promoting mediation as an alternative way of divorcing, a more family friendly Mm. process for people, a process that allows them to stay in a better state, to be able to co-parent their children. So we know there are lots of benefits and it would be hard, I think, for people. And I don't think people do disagree with the benefits of mediation. But bottom line is, it just hasn't been taken up by the public. And I wonder what your thoughts are on that. It's tragic. It really is. It's tragic because the government has, as you say, put so much time and energy. I think they're more frustrated than anyone else. They say, look, we've tried. Okay, let's be clear about their agenda. They hope that putting money into mediation means that they don't have to put money into lawyers, and that means it doesn't have to Well, they have, have very court. definite very calculations urgent. about how much but, money spent on mediation <laughs> removes costs absolutely. from uh, the judiciary. Yes, so, exactly. But we put that to one side. We mediators, as, as, as you say, know full well the entire benefits of mediation. Mm. So why hasn't it taken off after such a long time? Some of the reasons, well, maybe the mediation industry hasn't helped because at times it has been divided. It's been perhaps too pure in its expectations of how the mediation process would work. Perhaps a little more pragmatism could could, could have been benefited there. Perhaps it hasn't caught the public's imagination. Um, It's been used in a couple of soap operas uh, from time to time because we're all saying, well, we get it in the soap operas and then we'll say, yes, it'll work, etc. And it hasn't really come across very well. There was a series on television uh, in 2017 using a mediator, Mm. two different forms of mediation. I'm afraid some of the examples were actually quite good, but most actually weren't the most Mm. impressive. It didn't say to everyone, hey, guys, we really want to do this. Mm. I I just don't think we've sold the benefits of mediation well enough. I'm interested in just what you said there about you think perhaps it's been too pure. Just expand on that a little bit. Too pure in the sense that... Mediation came uh, to this country uh, from the therapeutic profession. Right. Uh, it, it did very well for that reason. The initial mediators were therapists and, mm. and, and they brought all the benefits of their profession, their skills to the mediation process. And so it tended to be a rather neutral process. It, it, it was encouraging the couple to build common ground, build bridges, help them to communicate. If they communicated better, they would be better at parenting, albeit they were now separated. If they were able to talk uh, in the same room together with the encouragement to help them talking, they would be able to reach some sort of resolution. That was great and it was fine. But then they became the hard to settle cases. They, they, that yeah. mediation model set, worked for, for a good number, but it didn't work for the very hard to settle cases. And they needed more direction. And so a number of uh, mediators, predominantly not all lawyers, mediators, mediators who were lawyers, adopted a directive style. Right. And for example, yeah. that's the style of mediation used significantly in countries like Australia, a directive style where as the couple were struggling to get to a settlement, the mediator would say, have you thought about this option? What if we were to do it this way? Or have you thought about a measure? Or have you thought about an ad back or an offset or things like that? Mm-hmm. Finding ways using the experience of the lawyer to help steer them onwards. And a number of couples have used that and find it more beneficial. Some don't want it. I think a lot of lawyers tend to refer their clients into a more directive style of mediation. It's a style that actually lawyer mediators are fairly similar to what goes on sometimes at courts, where the judge will try and encourage them at an FDR. An FDR is not mediation, but it's got similarities to it in as far as the judge encourages the parties to look along a certain direction. Sets expectations, puts the boundaries around what is possible. Yeah, Yeah. exactly. And so we've got that sort of model. And so that's where I think a lot of the mediations are now happening, particularly in the financial realm. Within the children realm, there's still the huge benefit of the more neutral therapeutic element to it, 
because you are trying to help the couple reach a resolution, but you'll also help future parenting. Mm -hmm. And where you've got the two, maybe there's an advantage in one mediator dealing with some of the children issues, another mediator dealing with some of the financial issues. In my firm, we have a lot of relocation cases where right. one parent wants yeah. to relocate to another mm -hmm. country. And it works phenomenally well because my colleague mediator, who's specialist child mediator, or used to working with children, etc., she'll see the parents initially and try and work out an arrangement for the relocation. Mm -hmm. Will you accept this? What if this, etc.? But often a component is, I can't afford it, or I won't, no, don't want to pay child support, or mm -hmm. whatever, or how am I going to afford to see my child in mm -hmm. South Africa or New York or wherever? And so I would then take over and do the mediation uh, on the financial side and then come to that arrangement. And then we would come back in one last session and pull them two lots together. And I think that's where mediation needs to be a little more creative. Use right. some of these creative elements. Mediation's great. It hasn't had the best publicity. It hasn't had been promoted. But it's crucial. And, and, mm. and the judges uh, see it so often as a benefit to be doing it. So, yes, the government's keen to actually push it out of the lawyers. But we mediators see the benefit for all sorts of couples to doing it. But it sounds like a, co it. a collaborative approach. Well, I mean, collaborative with a small c, as in a, a group of specialists doing their bit within a yeah. case and then somebody managing that case in its entirety for the benefit of that particular yeah. family. And it sounds like that sort of joining together of specialist practitioners is part and parcel of perhaps a new way forward for people getting divorced rather than thinking they need to go to one person. And, and I think that's where the way we practice has changed in perhaps 10 years. Right. Lawyers would do one job. This is what we do. Now we're almost sort of saying, OK, we've got these range of options to get mm. to a particular outcome. Tool, tools in a toolbox, some people describe it. It might be mediation. It might start as a lawyer who starts the disclosure process off, gets the disclosure, and then refers it to some like early neutral evaluation. And we've right. seen that take off in the last two or three years where a couple have got a dispute and they go to see a senior lawyer who gives an indication of what would happen if it went to court. It's like a private FDR. Right. So this is one lawyer not advising the couple, but no. giving them outline information about the parameters of the law, what they might expect. Yes. Okay. And, and, and that is now working very, very well. Mm. And the key to it is privileged. And so right. ultimately, you don't find yourself with, with an outcome that's binding. And then there's arbitration. And arbitration was formed about four or five years or so ago. And the crucial element of arbitration is binding. It's mm -hmm. effectively an out-of-court judging. Mm -hmm. Unlike private early neutral evaluation, it's open. And the benefit of that is you can get a final outcome, which uh, the judges have made very clear, will be bound. You, you, right. you've got an, uh, and so that's a real benefit. And, and the benefit of that is speed. So you get to go to an FDR, it doesn't settle, you're given a hearing in six months' time. But you're ready. Uh, why not have it in a month's time? Um, you've got to pay for the arbitrator, but apart from that, you choose the arbitrator. So you know who you're going to get as your private judge because mm -hmm. you've chosen them. Mm -hmm. You know you've got the indulgence of the private arbitrator reading the papers in advance. There's no, oh, well, they'll get the papers the night before yeah. and let's hope they don't have much to do and they can actually read the papers, etc. They'll spend time on reading the papers and they'll take an interactive approach. There'll be continuity. And so, okay, I think it's quite exciting that we've got this range yes. and that the lawyer mm -hmm. is one of them. Some of us are mediators, arbitrators, some are collaborative lawyers, some of us are just doing one only and working with colleagues. And, that. and I think what's exciting is that the clients can come and see us and we could say, OK, for you, it's best to do this. For you, it's best to do this. You need to issue proceedings quickly and then having issued proceedings, let's decide something else. I happen to think that in mediation, I think the Mayams are a good idea, but in the financial realm, I think mostly you need to get to disclosure and then you have mediation or whatever else it is. And I think sometimes disclosure is best that way through the legal process. But there again, um, some mediators will be very good at neutrally trying to gather the disclosure together. Mm -hmm. And many couples I know have felt much more comfortable in mutually giving the disclosure in in that way. So I think it is quite exciting in mm -hmm. that it's not something we've had more than about 10 or so years or so ago where we've got all these different skills. Lawyers can train us different skills. Non-lawyers can train us different skills. So there's mediators, the therapists, counsellors, collaborative lawyers all working alongside each other. So it's not just one profession. Mm -hmm. You've know, got to see a lawyer. said It's lots of professions and, and we're co-working. And I think that's far better for, for the public. And I think that's what the public expect now. Do you think it's easy enough for people, like the professionals in that case, to hand off cases to each other? Or do you think there are professional, I don't know what to call them, professional 
boundaries which prevent that free working because what you describe sounds like utopia for anyone yeah. getting divorced yeah, I wish. Doesn't it? <laughs> well it does you know you, you come along happen. you present information mutually to people about the different wide range now it seems of options they have much more creative than simply pitching up at a lawyer's yeah. office, yeah. office and saying, and please, can you serve? see you in court in 12 exactly. months' time. I'll give you an outcome. There's, a, there's a, an infinite range of different ways. And obviously, I would say, wouldn't I, that we're playing our part with what we're doing at, and, at, at totally Amicable. Agree. And that's not from a legal perspective, but from a lay perspective. So we know that there are lots of ways of working together. And our job is to point people to a lawyer when they need the legal advice and to help them in our way when when Mm. perhaps they don't need that. So we know that that all works. But one of the barriers or one of the difficulties we have is trying to break down mindsets, professional barriers for people who feel that they can't refer out or refer on. Mm. Or for example, with collaborative law, if you've started in a collaborative pattern and you it's not going to work, you then have to step away from the case. So have we made it too difficult to get to a good outcome for people? Let's be frank. One of the reasons why it doesn't work is that lawyers won't let go of their cases because they'll lose the costs. So we all know that. There's no point (laughs) in ignoring it. That does happen. It happens, I think, less in England than some other countries where where there really is no referral out. Mm -hmm. I think we have got a good record in this country of referring out. I happen to think the specialist lawyers are probably better, not all, Mm -hmm. but probably better because they know the confidence of of coming through. I think as well that if you refer out, it doesn't mean you're going to lose all of the other necessary work. It'll sometimes come back again. And we work with our clients alongside mediation. In arbitration, we're doing basically the same sort of work. We're just doing it in a different fashion, early neutral evaluation. We're getting the help of somebody. But yes, we've got to find a culture change. Now, 25, 30 years ago, John Cornwall, a phenomenal solicitor, one of the real leaders of our profession in the last 50 years, came up with the idea of a code of practice. We need to transform the way the work was undertaken. Uh, Such admiration for for that. And he founded the code of practice, became the SFLA in resolution, etc. To a certain extent, there's a culture change that we're coming to fairly soon, where we've got all these different options, and we need to find a culture change where we're going to more likely to move into them. And I can't but think that that will come alongside the greater use of the digital technology Mm. because the disruptive technologies are per se disruptive. And I would hope that the disruptive technologies will cause us to reflect again on how we're doing that work. And it will cause the public to ask questions of us as we're doing the work, say, hey, I don't have to do that. I can do this. We're seeing a lot of unbundled services, mm. the so-called idea where people can't afford the full range of services where, where, where they get us from the beginning and we do absolutely everything. And we take on almost all law firms with no tech on unbundled services. If you're going to do unbundled services, you could might as well have unbundled another form of ADR within it. Uh, so if you're going to use your lawyer for some part of the process and then you're going to act in person and then perhaps go off to mediation or whatever, arbitration is being used not just for the big money cases, but for some fairly modest cases. So you would have an unbundled service where you get your lawyer to help prepare some of the disclosure and then you'll go into arbitration or whatever. And so I think the unbundled services connected with the digital technology and the availability of the range of services I think over the next five, seven years will produce quite a significant difference. Um, right. I, I, one of my also heroes is Richard Susskind, yes. who's done a huge <laughs> amount of work. Everything he writes is by and large very worth reading. Um, and, and he has actually said, where is the profession going? And I, I think it's compulsory reading, find out where are we going over the next five, seven years. Beyond seven years is with the way technology is rushing ahead, almost impossible to say. Mm. But over the next five, seven years, and he is the one who is saying, we will just have a different need for professional services. Mm. We will need people at different levels. We will continue to need, in my opinion, paralegals, very junior lawyers, who will be interacting with the digital technology. Mm. It mm. won't be the senior part, et cetera. No. But we data, will, da- put, inputting, inputting data, inputting, making absolutely. sure everything's correct, yep, yep. making sure it all and links we'll to the need right the top court lawyers, sources. experienced lawyers who say, tactically, where are we going? This is the likely mm. outcome, taking the bigger view. And so that's where it's going. Now, you've got the big problem of the and many in the middle, which is something we've got to analyse and where it will go. So if Richard Susskind is right and the whole way in which we Mm -hmm. operate will change, can't we at the same time as changing that bring into the extra ADR, the extra way of working, Mm -hmm. etc., 
I think within that, we will have to have a change in the financial law, generally because I think we need to change it, but also because I think it needs to adapt to how right. we'll work more digitally in the future. What frustrates me, and, I, and maybe you share this, is the way that this is all portrayed in the media, and obviously part of the reason for, for talking about it in the podcast is to try and address that balance and to demonstrate that there are so many positive and creative ways of coming at this, coming at a situation which is obviously deeply sad for people, but it doesn't have to be a disaster. It doesn't have to be a train wreck. There are lots of different ways of doing this now. And it hugely frustrates family lawyers right across the country when they see just a few cases uh, reported in the media and just a few, dare I say, lawyers report in the media as uh, as red-blooded, going for every last penny, uh, heavily litigious. Let's be fair, there are a few cases that need that approach. Uh, Mm -hmm. we, We can't ignore but to have the whole of the legal profession, family law profession, coloured in this yes. particular fashion, that we, we, we are just after the costs, frankly, and, and sometimes clients are surprised when we say, well, actually, I think you shouldn't do this. And they say, but actually, you're going to get more costs if I do this particular mm-hmm. cause of action. No, no, I don't think you should. I just don't think that uh, we get a good enough representation. Mm-hmm. And what we do get is not very reflective of the way the vast majority of sensible very specialist family law solicitors and barristers around the country are trying to help their clients day by day with an ultimate purpose of settling, Mm. representing them well, of course. David, we've run out of time, but this has been absolutely (laughs) fascinating. I can't thank you enough. So, David, how can people find out more about you? Where can they find you? Uh, My practice is the International Family Law Group. We're based in Covent Garden. We set ourselves up uh, 2007 with a vision for serving the needs of international clients. It's www iflg.uk.com. We're distinctly UK-based, but we are worldwide serving our clients, hence the UK, hence the .com. (laughs) Fantastic. You can find out more about Amicable at www.amicable.io, or you can follow me on Twitter at Kate underscore daily, or you can follow the Divorce Podcast at Divorce underscore podcast. Thank you for listening. Mm -hmm.